so we are going to have military timing. Um, I'm Ryan Heath. I'm pleased to welcome you to the latest Playbook Breakfast. It's our third in a week. I think that's a, a very impressive speed. Um, if we're going to keep it up, I might have to be turned into a hologram later in 2017. But we'll do our very best to, to keep, up, keep up this series of events for you. So today, our special guest is General Petr Pavel, who is the chairman of the NATO Military Committee. So we're very excited to have him here. And we're very pleased to have back again as our sponsor and partner, Raytheon. Uh, they did the general, sorry, the, the Jens Stoltenberg interview last year. So we're very pleased to have them back on board. And without them, this event wouldn't be possible. Now, of course, welcome to everybody who is watching online for this event. We're excited that you're here and are able to ask questions in the room, but you're also able to ask questions online now. So everyone just remember there are several thousand people who are watching via the Politico website and our Facebook page as well. Now, the important thing that I want you all to know before we get started today is the best way to ask a question at this event. So we're using a system called Slido, and that is via a website that you can all access via your phone, your iPad, your laptop, whatever screen it is you have with you this morning. And of course, all of you watching online can ask questions as well. So you go to the website, which is SLI. Dot do. You enter in hashtag playbook event, and that's how you access the system. Then just type in your name if you want to be known that it's coming from you. Type in your question, and it will appear on these screens. Well, sorry, that screen and that screen. Um, and I will get it here. The general will also see the questions, and the ones that are most popular in the audience rise to the top. So it doesn't mean that you only get your question asked if it rises to the top, but there are lots of ways for you to have your voice heard in the event. Of course, you can always tweet about it or make mention of it on other social media websites, just use the hashtag Playbook Breakfast if you're doing that. And of course, it's a political event, so we don't let you out the door without reminding you that we love your feedback. So anything that you like or don't like about this event, if you have an idea for how we can improve, one of the reasons why these events work so well and we're so able to do them on this regular basis is that they're really driven by you. So please take a couple of minutes to fill out that form and tell us what you really think. So without further ado, I'll invite up onto the stage Christopher Lombardi, who's Vice President of Raytheon International, and he'll do the opening remarks. Thank you, Chris. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, General. Uh, on behalf of Raytheon, it, it is truly an honor to be able to be here and sponsor this breakfast and also to make some opening remarks uh, to introduce General Pavel. In March of 1999, uh, the Czech Republic became a full member of NATO in the small town of Independence, Missouri. And I say finally because I think it was only inevitable that a country that played such a large part in the creation of NATO become a member of the alliance. If we go back nearly 70 years and think of one event that was instrumental in the creation of NATO, I would say it was the Soviet-sponsored coup in Czechoslovakia in 1948. That event was so significant that it put in place the steps that would ultimately pass through the Marshall Plan and result in the establishment of NATO. Then, just 20 years later, as Alexander Dubček sought to liberalize most of, some of, sorry, the communist constraints on the people of Czechoslovakia, a half million Warsaw Pact troops were sent to occupy the country in order to stop any nonconformity to Moscow's ways. What the Soviets thought would take four days to suppress took more than eight months, and that Prague Spring became an inspiration to many, including Václav Havel. That clampdown in 1968 was in the forefronts of the minds of many when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, as countries previously under the domination of the Soviet Union started to choose their own destiny. In Prague in 1991, President Havel formally, sorry, formally ended the Warsaw Treaty, and that same spring, he came to Brussels and spoke to the North Atlantic Council. Havel reminded NATO leaders that any European nation had the right to determine its own fate and that NATO was instrumental in protecting freedom. Havel's speech triggered NATO's enlargement debate making room for others that wanted to share the burden of collective defense of shared values. That debate within NATO, sparked by a Czech leader who had seen the repressive ways of non-democratic methods, led to an expansion of NATO in 1999 to include the Czech Republic. And although it has only been 18 years since that accession, I would argue that the Czech Republic has an outsized influence on the growth and character of NATO since 1999. The country's support of burden sharing, smart defense, and interoperability are key 
to the NATO's core mission of deterrence and collective defense. The Czech Republic immediately joined the Kosovo Air Campaign and subsequent peacekeeping operations. Prague then hosted the NATO summit in 2002, where members invited seven new states to start the accession process and adopted measures to improve military capabilities, what became known as the Prague Capabilities Command. Moreover, the Czech Republic never hesitated to join the initial counterterrorist operations in Afghanistan and, of course, is part of ISAF today. Here is a country with 10 million people immediately embracing the concept of burden sharing. The government and the armed forces of the Czech Republic understood the threat on NATO's periphery and, as a new but resolute member, envisioned working together to find collective solutions. And they have been doing that ever since they joined. Under General Pavel's leadership, the military committee has a keen interest in enabling smart defense projects. The strategic and efficient use of resources is key to addressing threats like ballistic missiles, information warfare, warfare excuse me, and cyber threats. We truly believe that industry can be a valuable partner in putting this concept into practice, from the beginning of the planning process to the implementation of long-term strategies. Together, we can strengthen and deepen the community of values we seek to protect. And this community includes all of us here in Europe and across the Atlantic. Raytheon has been in Europe for over 100 years with two thirds of our international partners and 2,500 employees here. We have a history in Europe, protecting in Europe with advanced capabilities built in Europe. We are also now seeing security cooperation from the EU. The European Defense Fund encourages greater collaboration across the EU and Commissioner, I'm sorry, Commission President Juncker in Prague earlier this month said it was time to integrate militaries and be smarter in developing, implementing capabilities. The Commission is helping member sta states spend taxpayer money more effectively, reducing duplications and getting better value for money. We fully support these objectives and can contribute to the ambitious work of helping Europe protect and defend its citizens. And NATO itself, traditionally invoked as the argument against European defense integration has been clear on how the EU can and should contribute to mutual defense in a complementary way. The NATO military committee is also working to build interoperability into every capability. Interoperability means more efficient and effective national military capabilities across the board. Interoperable systems like late radar platforms or missile defense systems form a solid base for genuine burden sharing. And NATO must commit to sustained and proactive coordination. And the Czech Republic is leading the way in this planning as well. In their defense strategy document released earlier this year, the Czech Ministry of Defense states that effective and efficient buildup of defense capabilities accomplished within the framework of the Czech Republic's defense planning is driven primarily by NATO's planning process and is in tune with the needs of the EU. In other words, they are already coordinating their planning in the area of collective defense. Let me conclude with a quote from President Havel <clears throat> from his statement to the NAC in 1991, which is absolutely relevant today. People and nations gifted with responsibility do not hesitate to help one another in the protection of values they consider supreme. Thank you again for the opportunity to say a few remarks and for sharing the stage with someone who has never shirked from his responsibility to protect General Peter Pavel. Welcome, General. Thank you. Now, I was excited to learn um, when we were getting ready for this event that you were making a trip to Australia and New Zealand that you've just come back from. I've got to be honest, I didn't realize the koala bear threat required this big NATO intervention. Can you uh, tell us a bit more about what took you down there? Well. Um NATO has a number of uh, partners all around the globe and uh, uh, we have uh, great uh, partners uh, in Australia and New Zealand, to, uh, the two countries that are not only uh, one of the most interoperable with NATO, but also uh, one of uh, the most responsible for regional and uh, global security issues. And these two countries are contributing to a, a wide variety of activities uh, uh, that uh, NATO is doing from operations through exercises uh, to uh, uh, training and uh, cooperation in defense capacity building. Uh, so uh, uh, they uh, deserve uh, also uh, something in return 
That means uh, to uh, pay respect uh, to these two countries by visiting them, having discussions with uh, military political leadership, uh, uh, talking uh, to uh, academia and understanding uh, their uh, perspective that uh, may be very useful uh, for us uh, in uh, Brussels as well. As well. And, and from their end, I understand uh, Australia obviously has a troop commitment in Afghanistan. And I think you were saying that that's going to be an ongoing commitment, that there's not really a, an end date in sight there. Is that something that was discussed between you and the, the armed forces there? That was uh, one of uh, the main points on our agenda, because uh, both uh, Australia and New Zealand are contributing to a resolute support mission. And uh, quite obviously, they are interested in uh, duration and uh, perspectives. Uh, and. Uh, NATO military leaders uh, um, never uh, uh, were uh, so optimistic uh, to say that uh, there is a clear end date to a mission. Uh, we uh, uh, maintain uh, the argument that the mission has to be conditions-based, and once uh, conditions are met, uh, we can uh, claim success and uh, leave a responsibility fully uh, to our Afghan colleagues. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, these conditions are not yet there, so we have to continue our effort and uh, all of uh, our nations, uh, all of the members of coalition in uh, Afghanistan understand it. Mm -hmm. And now another issue on that side of the world that feels a bit closer to home is the dispute around the South China Sea. Uh, what did you learn about how that threat is being perceived down under? For uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, especially uh, the, uh, countries uh, that are very much uh, uh, dependent on uh, trade in uh, the region, uh, freedom of navigation, freedom of trade uh, is uh, crucial. Uh, but it's also for us in Europe. Uh, we uh, tend to believe that the uh, South China Sea is uh, far distant to our interests. Why should we care? Uh, I'm always trying to, uh, to explain uh, that uh, our own prosperity, our own stability and security is also dependent on uh, free uh, world trade. And uh, there is a large portion of uh, trade uh, running through South China Sea. So if there is uh, any disruption uh, to uh, this uh, freedom of navigation, we would all feel it uh, being it, uh, here in Europe uh, or in North America or in Australia and New Zealand. So uh, uh, we are all uh, concerned the same way, and we have to uh, pay attention to the developments there. Mm -hmm. Now, if we bring the focus a bit closer to home, the EU obviously finally went through and formally approved the EU defence cooperation plans at the Leaders' Summit last week. Uh, what does that mean for you on the military side of NATO? Is that something that is really in the distance and not something that will affect your work in the coming years, or is it going to be an immediate impact? European Union uh, uh, didn't come uh, with a uh, uh, security and defense policy yesterday. Uh, it's uh, there for a long time. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, structured uh, cooperation in uh, security area is uh, uh, part of uh, Lisbon Treaty. Uh, it's uh, Article 42 that uh, speaks about structured co uh, defense cooperation. Uh, well, uh, in uh, recent uh, months uh, and let's say two years, uh, uh, the impulse uh, for developing uh, further uh, defense uh, and security policy of the uh, European Union was uh, strengthened by uh, um, dynamic uh, security uh, uh, developments uh, in and around Europe. I think it's quite natural, and uh, um, there is nothing uh, wrong in uh, um, developing uh, uh, more uh, defense uh, capabilities uh, in the uh, European Union, uh, provided that uh, uh, there is uh, no competition um, between uh, EU and NATO. Quite often we hear uh, that uh, uh, the two institutions are competing. Uh, in uh, reality, what we see is much more uh, complementarity, much more efforts to synchronize our efforts uh, than uh, competing uh, for uh, employment. And we can see it in the area of uh, uh, development of defense capabilities, uh, reactions uh, to uh, new uh, uh, challenges uh, such as uh, cyber threat or hybrid threats. Uh, we can see it also in uh, focusing uh, uh, on uh, research and development, uh, on uh, uh, synchronizing the efforts of defense industries. So in this sense, uh, I think uh, development of uh, European defense identity is a very healthy process. Mm -hmm. I guess it can be quite important for countries like Finland and Sweden, because it's, it's easy to forget that they're not 
NATO members, even though they're obviously members of the EU and, and cooperate with NATO a lot. Do you, do you think it will help on that level to make sure that all of the EU is properly defended? Well, um, I think uh, when uh, we see uh, security of uh, Europe uh, only within uh, the framework of uh, one or the other institution, we are uh, missing uh, some parts of Europe because there are still nations that are not members uh, of one or uh, even both organizations. And it's difficult uh, to uh, consider any uh, effective uh, defense against the new challenges, especially those uh, coming from the south and southeast. Uh, that uh, we can only confine them uh, within uh, the structures of one institution only. So uh, we have to not only uh, cooperate very effectively uh, between the two institutions, but also to embrace uh, other uh, nations that are not uh, members of either one or both uh, institutions. So, and we have to cooperate with them as well. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to the first question on the screen there. It's a question about Turkey. Uh, so it's anonymous, so we don't know who's asked it, but uh, they want to know how you would characterize current relations between Turkey and other allies, given the political tensions that have called into question Turkey's place in NATO. We have to uh, see uh, our situation in uh, the context. Uh, Turkey uh, is exposed uh, to uh, both uh, major challenges uh, that uh, NATO is uh, now facing. That is, on one hand, uh, state actor uh, Russia, on the other hand, non-state actors uh, uh, as uh, extremism, terrorism, and uh, migration. All uh, these uh, severely affect uh, uh, Turkey uh, directly. Uh, in that sense, uh, Turkey uh, feels uh, probably uh, more threatened than, than other uh, nations, uh, and uh, quite naturally, uh, their uh, focus on uh, di uh, different aspects of uh, their internal security is different, uh, seen from Ankara or from other European capitals. Uh, we uh, see uh, Turkey as uh, an important NATO ally uh, that uh, uh, needs to be supported because uh, uh, Turkey uh, is an uh, element of European security and uh, we uh, cannot detach it uh, from uh, Europe in that sense. We uh, work uh, very closely uh, with uh, uh, Turkish uh, military authorities. Uh, uh, there uh, were uh, some uh, concerns uh, recently about the reduction of number of, uh, of uh, personnel. Now uh, the levels uh, are almost... You mean based in Brussels? Uh, uh, I mean based in uh, NATO military structures uh, mm -hmm. after the attempted coup. Mm -hmm. So uh, the levels now almost uh, back, uh, back to previous levels and uh, uh, we work uh, with the uh, Turkish authorities uh, um, the same way as uh, we did before. Because mm -hmm. well, it's the case, you, you work with the people you're given, you don't have any say over who appears or doesn't appear at that, shape and other That's with, uh, with, with all nations and uh, we have uh, uh, criteria for every position uh, that uh, nations uh, are sending uh, people to and uh, if these criteria are met uh, then uh, we'll obviously work with everyone. Mm -hmm. um, now that we've done Turkey, let's get on to Russia. I think we hear a lot about Russia but from someone who's dealing with it every single day, how real do you perceive the Russian threat? Uh, we uh, and uh, I mean uh, we in uh, uniform uh, we uh, defined uh, the threat uh, based on uh, two major uh, elements. So one is the capability, the other is uh, the intent. Uh, when it comes to capability, there is no doubt uh, that uh, Russia uh, is uh, developing their capabilities uh, both in uh, conventional and uh, nuclear uh, components. Uh, when it comes to uh, exercises, uh, um, their uh, um, ability to uh, uh, deploy troops uh, for a long distance uh, and use them uh, effectively uh, uh, quite uh, uh, far away from their own territory, uh, there are no doubts about uh, their uh, growing capabilities. When it comes to intent, it's uh, not uh, so clear because uh, we cannot clearly say that uh, Russia uh, has uh, aggressive uh, intents uh, against NATO. Uh, but uh, there are elements uh, that uh, have to worry us and we have to uh, stay ready. So uh, we uh, take uh, this even potential threat very seriously. 
we do everything uh, possible to uh, be ready, both in terms of uh, capabilities and uh, readiness, uh, to face uh, any potential threat uh, that uh, would uh, mirror the situation uh, we know from uh, Crimea, from eastern Ukraine, uh, not to be repeated uh, against uh, uh, any uh, NATO ally. And in terms of the developments that worry you, are we talking missile threat in Kaliningrad? Uh, you're talking about the controversy around the ZAPAD exercise that's coming up in September? There are uh, multiple sources uh, of uh, uh, worries or concerns. Uh, one of them uh, may be, as you say, uh, exercise uh, activity. Uh, Russia is conducting a number of uh, large-scale exercises that uh, go uh, well uh, beyond uh, OSCE criteria uh, for uh, uh, declaration, uh, but uh, Russia always tries to uh, keep uh, below that level uh, by uh, uh, like, uh, breaking uh, the exercise into smaller elements uh, that uh, stay below the threshold. Uh, um, the, uh, we also observe uh, uh, increased and more assertive uh, narrative uh, in uh, uh, both uh, political and uh, military leadership uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, taking all uh, necessary measures uh, to face uh, NATO military buildup. Uh, we face a uh, uh, huge uh, modernization of uh, all uh, Russian military. The program uh, is uh, to um, replace uh, more than 70% of all the equipment uh, by uh, 2021. And uh, we also observe uh, 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 the notes of uh, uh, increased uh, military capability and presence. And you mentioned Kaliningrad, uh, another one uh, is now growing uh, in Crimea. Uh, we uh, uh, face uh, a military buildup in Syria some efforts in, in Libya, so um, there are uh, numerous uh, reasons uh, to be concerned. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's also possible there's stuff below the radar that we can't even know about. If we think back to cybersecurity and all the new possibilities that exist in the cyber world, um, I presume that NATO allies are doing their own networked virtual exercises as well, and it's entirely possible that Russia is doing the same. Well. Um, we uh, talk about uh, these uh, new challenges uh, that uh, we, uh, uh, for which we used uh, the term hybrid warfare. Uh, uh, Russia is not using uh, that term. However, uh, it is uh, the whole range of non-conventional uh, measures that uh, Russia brought uh, into new level uh, and uh, into a, a new level of integration. Uh, we may uh, talk about uh, cyber, uh, about uh, use of uh, special forces, uh, about uh, propaganda, information warfare. And they, all, uh, these, uh, all these elements uh, for uh, Russia create a continuum of uh, warfare from uh, peacetime to war. So uh, there is no uh, distinction between uh, peace and conflict. Uh, Russia sees it as a continuum of, of, uh, of uh, um, confrontation. Uh, we obviously um, take a lot of measures uh, uh, to uh, counter both uh, hybrid and cyber uh, alone as uh, NATO and also in uh, very close cooperation with the EU. Mm -hmm. And what are the trends, just one final Russia question, uh, in Baltic and northern airspace? Because I think, you know, if you're not thinking about it every day, it can be easy to forget how crowded that airspace is. And I heard recently the Danish Air Force had to miss a ceremonial flyover because they were too busy chasing away Russian planes from their airspace. We've n lots of numerous incidents that anyone who doesn't know about it could easily Google. Um, what's the risk of something going wrong in that sort of crowded airspace? There is always uh, always risk uh, that uh, something, uh, something will go wrong uh, when uh, uh, the two uh, forces uh, that are not friendly are uh, too close to each other. And uh, we are uh, close to each other uh, not only in uh, the Baltic Sea uh, airspace, but also in Black Sea airspace, uh, all along uh, the border uh, uh, in uh, Syria. Uh, but uh, up to now, uh, in uh, most of these cases, uh, uh, we haven't uh, been uh, 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 observing uh, the situation uh, that uh, would be clearly hostile against, uh, against NATO. Uh, there are some uh, violations uh, of uh, um, the airspace, uh, not uh, necessarily uh, incursion into uh, uh, NATO uh, territory, uh, but uh, we are mostly uh, uh, witnessing uh, um, what we call uh, 
uh, non-professional behavior uh, in, in the air. Uh, so uh, uh, some uh, rules uh, that uh, are uh, not only given, uh, some uh, are a common practice. And when uh, these uh, rules uh, are broken, then uh, the chance of uh, uh, getting into uh, the incident is uh, pretty close. So we are trying to develop mechanisms uh, uh, with uh, Russia uh, where uh, we uh, will be able to discuss uh, all uh, transparency and uh, risk reduction measures to avoid any uh, even potential incident. Mm -hmm. Now let's get on to President Trump, who we might describe as the elephant in any NATO room these days. Um, we've got another question there, and it's related obviously to the defence spending and to um, efforts to increase um, towards the 2% target among NATO allies. Is, I guess the question then it comes from the floor, I had it myself, is Donald Trump's intervention, is that what's actually going to make NATO great again? Is it actually perfect timing to get the alliance into a new groove to deal with these new threats? Well, I hope you don't expect me uh, to uh, make um, any assessment or evaluation of President Trump, but uh, I will uh, rather talk about the effects uh, of uh, uh, his approach. And um, it, it's fair to say uh, that uh, the pressure on uh, uh, non-US uh, uh, allies uh, to increase their defense spending uh, didn't come with, uh, with President Trump. Yeah, it's been here for a long time, and uh, uh, the presidents uh, before him uh, were pushing allies for uh, fair uh, burden sh uh, sharing. Uh, the way the way uh, that uh, President Trump adopted is, uh, adopted is uh, slightly different and probably more assertive. But uh, the effect is that uh, it, uh, it uh, created uh, some uh, kind of wake-up call uh, to uh, European allies. Uh, that uh, the time has come to actually act. Yeah. And the uh, 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 vast majority of nations uh, uh, already increased uh, their defense spending. Others uh, are on the way to, uh, to do it. Uh, and uh, the commitment uh, was adopted in uh, Wales and then uh, reconfirmed in uh, Warsaw uh, for uh, all of the allies uh, to uh, uh, come to 2% uh, level uh, spending uh, 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 by uh, 2024. And uh, we see uh, numerous examples uh, where countries uh, are uh, meeting uh, these criteria. We will have uh, three more countries uh, uh, this year to meet the 2% uh, threshold, mm -hmm. and others uh, will uh, be approaching it in uh, years to come. Yeah. Do you have a sense of when nearly all or all of the countries might meet the threshold? Because some are, some are really still down at 1%. Even Hungary, Czech Republic is barely above 1%. So it's not going to happen in the next two or three years, is it, for some of those countries? Well, uh, the commitment uh, uh, taken uh, by uh, heads of state and government uh, in uh, Wales uh, was speaking about a decade. That means uh, by 2024. Nations uh, are now uh, developing uh, their national plans, uh, uh, how to uh, get uh, to uh, this, uh, this level. Uh, but uh, we also uh, have to uh, think about uh, not only uh, figures, uh, what is also important uh, are the capabilities and uh, commitments. And uh, we have to see it uh, in a bigger picture. Uh, that uh, nations uh, are uh, to uh, bring uh, their 2% of GDP, but it's only a tool how to uh, achieve capabilities that we need uh, for better collective defense and for better reaction to new challenges. And uh, we're looking at it uh, and uh, we're uh, working on development on uh, the series of uh, measures and uh, matrix uh, criteria. Uh, that would uh, be used uh, to uh, measure uh, uh, contributions of nations to uh, these collective efforts. Because, I mean, we could all just give the soldiers a pay rise, but that's not going to bring new skills. It's not going to help you deal with cyber threats, because I guess cyber brings the cost down rather than, than up when you switch the capability there. That's why, uh, that's why uh, uh, the commitment uh, speaks about um, 2% uh, on uh, uh, um, share on GDP, but also uh, out of these uh, 2%, 20% uh, on uh, investments or modernization or new equipment, because uh, that is uh, what actually delivers the capability. Um, I guess one last question on the budget. 
for all of the EU's flaws, one thing that it tends to do well is enforce its rules and targets. You know, it gets there in the end when we speak about the EU. But NATO uh, lacks that enforcement mechanism. Somewhat ironically, given all of the weapons that NATO has access to, you can't really force people to, to do anything there. Um, what, what, aside from EU-style budget surveillance or Trump getting very excited, can you do to make the Allies step up to the plate? Is that, is that something that is factored into working at headquarters or is that something that is left to na national capitals? NATO is a community of uh, sovereign nations and uh, um, um, all uh, major decisions are based on their sovereign will, uh, including uh, uh, defense spending. But uh, uh, there is uh, also something like uh, collective responsibility and uh, all the nations are aware that uh, uh, they have to uh, bring their share to our collective, uh, collective defense. One of the ways uh, how to uh, uh, let's say increase uh, uh, nations' uh, commitment is increasing level of uh, transparency. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg uh, uh, started uh, the practice of uh, bringing to uh, the ministerial meetings as well as uh, to uh, the top level meetings, to the summits, uh, the overviews of how uh, nations uh, are actually uh, performing. Uh, and uh, w uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we are now waiting, uh, working on a set of criteria how to uh, uh, measure uh, better uh, the effectiveness. Uh, uh, of uh, national contributions. And this uh, level of transparency also uh, add uh, to uh, will of nations uh, to contribute uh, at a more uh, um, responsible level. Mm -hmm. uh, and a question now from David Herzenhorn, who's our chief Brussels correspondent and follows NATO closely. He asks, is there a risk that pressure for NATO to increase its focus on terrorism? And we saw that declaration at the leaders meeting in May. Um, Given that terror is now often a police issue, is that shift towards the military going to take away the focus from uh, focus on threats by state actors, where you'll, you'll get stuck in the weeds of, of non-state actor threats? NATO leaders recognized uh, and uh, uh, reaffirmed uh, that uh, for the alliance, uh, uh, we, we uh, see now two major uh, threat streams. Uh, one is uh, uh, state actors, uh, mainly represented by Russia. Uh, the other non-state actors, uh, uh, terrorism, extremism. Uh, we don't have a luxury uh, to focus on uh, one or uh, the other or take them in sequence. So uh, uh, we are fully aware that we have to address uh, all the challenges at the same time and that uh, we have to uh, uh, have a balanced approach uh, to uh, these challenges. Uh, nations uh, are obviously concerned that uh, we uh, do not uh, put uh, too much uh, attention to uh, one uh, region or flank mm -hmm. and that we keep uh, what uh, uh, is called within NATO 360 uh, degrees approach. Uh, that is uh, to uh, address uh, uh, fairly uh, all concerns uh, coming from all directions. And that brings us to another question from VZ on the, the board here, which is about your views on the increasing use of Chinese technology in Europe's critical infrastructure. Is, is that one layer beyond NATO's interest or is that amongst that 360 degree view that you just spoke of? Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm not in a position uh, to talk about uh, use of uh, Chinese technology in uh, NATO military domain. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, all the uh, new equipment uh, coming uh, to our uh, forces uh, is uh, thoroughly screened mm -hmm. and it uh, has to uh, meet uh, very uh, rigorous uh, uh, security uh, criteria. So I'm uh, uh, not aware that uh, that uh, would be a concern mm -hmm. for military in NATO. But more generally in Europe's critical infrastructure. And, and I guess we can have a debate about what is critical infrastructure. Some people would like our election processes to be classified as critical infrastructure, but I think mostly it's defined as things like uh, electricity networks and other um, key networks. And um, you don't see a, a threat there from non-NATO countries uh, using technology or selling technology into member, member countries. I think that is uh, one of the aspects of our globalized world uh, that uh, we simply cannot avoid uh, uh, sharing uh, technologies uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, say, um, I wouldn't say a word infiltration, but, uh, but uh, some uh, uh, 
participation of uh, these technologies uh, in our uh, lives, uh, being it uh, civilian or military infrastructure. Uh, but um, we have to do um, our best uh, to always uh, be in control uh, on uh, all of uh, these uh, systems and not to allow uh, any uh, external interference. I'm going to be mean and bring in a Brexit question there because we're on the, with the general field of uh, peripheral threats. Um, and the question from Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous is, given the UK's recent commitment um, to meeting the 2% target, I think they're already at 2.2%, actually. Um, so they're one of the good guys uh, in the NATO field, at least. Um, do you think Brexit poses a challenge for NATO? Uh, in my view, it doesn't uh, pose a challenge to NATO. Uh, uh, the United Kingdom uh, is a uh, firm and uh, one of the um, uh, pillar uh, uh, states uh, of the alliance. Uh, it's uh, one of the strongest uh, NATO uh, uh, allies uh, uh, military-wise uh, in uh, Europe. So uh, uh, we don't see any, any, any direct uh, challenge uh, for NATO coming uh, from, from Brexit. Uh, um, uh, just opposite, uh, many uh, representatives uh, of the United Kingdom expressed uh, uh, their uh, uh, more focused approach. Uh, it could uh, to, be almost to, the opposite, to, yes, where they give NATO. a renewed commitment to NATO. Exactly. So um, um, I, I, I don't uh, see any, any um, direct uh, negative impact on, of Brexit uh, on NATO. Mm -hmm. Now, the EU might be losing members, but you're gaining them. You just recently welcomed Montenegro into the club. Um, is, is there anything that Montenegro's entry into NATO uh, means? Is it a case study for how to accelerate uh, investment in infrastructure and, and defense spending? Is it uh, a good sign that Russia is not going to have increased influence in the Balkan region? Tell, tell us more about what you think Montenegro means for your efforts. Well, um Someone may say that uh, Montenegro is a small country with a small military and, uh, and uh, that it doesn't add uh, too much uh, to a military capability of, of NATO. But uh, we simply cannot uh, measure everything uh, by figures. Uh, NATO, uh, uh, Montenegro accession to NATO uh, is an important uh, political signal. Not only uh, to the countries uh, in the Balkans, especially in the Western Balkans, uh, uh, but also to all the others uh, that uh, NATO policy of open door uh, is still in place, uh, that uh, we are a community of nations uh, based on uh, same values uh, and uh, uh, whichever country has uh, an interest uh, to join the alliance and meets uh, the criteria and there is a mutual interest uh, on uh, uh, the side of the country and NATO uh, to, uh, to have that country in, uh, in uh, this, uh, this uh, community of nations that uh, uh, the opportunity is uh, still there. So I think uh, there is much more than uh, just a military contribution to the alliance. And uh, we uh, very much welcome uh, uh, Montenegro as a new member. And the Montenegrin prime minister, he sat down with Politico Susan Glasser and did a podcast with her. And he said that being shoved by President Trump was the best thing that could have ever happened to him and his country um, <laughs> with all the attention um, and possibly some sympathy that it gained him. Uh, do you think there will be other leaders uh, trying to get close to Mr. Trump and accidentally falling over or, or being pushed at future meetings? Well, <laughs> I, I don't think I can comment on that. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, we, we touched on terror before. Obviously, we see not necessarily increasing numbers of deaths, but increasing numbers of ways and possibly increased numbers of attacks. What, what more can NATO really do? Is, is, is it ever possible to say that you can eliminate the threat from non-state actors like that? Or, or does there come a point where you just have to say, we have limited capabilities and society needs to adjust or find other ways to deal with that threat? I think we have to uh, see uh, terrorism, extremism in a broader context. Uh, quite often, uh, it's being narrowed uh, in, uh, in recent uh, months and uh, years on uh, ISIL and physical elements of ISIL. Uh, the fight against terrorism uh, uh, didn't start uh, with ISIL and will not end with, with ISIL. Uh, uh, I think uh, 
the attention of, of media, uh, obviously created uh, by uh, urgent developments in uh, the region, is uh, very much focused on uh, this terrorist organization. Uh, but um, NATO is taking part in uh, fighting terrorism uh, since uh, 1991, uh, when uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, ent uh, entered uh, Afghanistan. Oh, sorry, it's uh, 2000, 2001. And, uh, uh, since then, uh, uh, NATO is contributing to fighting terrorism on a number of uh, fronts. Uh, uh, first, uh, direct fight in Afghanistan, uh, then uh, uh, support to a number of nations that are affected by terrorism and extremism in building their own uh, capabilities. Uh, NATO is also involved in uh, training Iraqi uh, forces. Uh, we uh, share uh, intelligence and best practices uh, with a number of nations affected by terrorism. But, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I have to say that uh, NATO can only uh, uh, contribute to one set of uh, measures. Uh, while counterterrorism uh, will be much broader effort, uh, much longer term, uh, uh, not necessarily limited uh, by uh, the physical existence of, uh, of ISIL, because it is the ideology, uh, it is uh, the root causes that uh, we, we have to tackle. Mm -hmm. And uh, there uh, we have to uh, work uh, all together at much broader front, uh, uh, NATO together with the EU, mm -hmm with the UN, with uh, regional uh, organizations, uh, with partner countries, uh, and uh, all of them uh, will have their share on uh, fighting terrorism and contributing to measures at military, political, economic, social, cultural, educational, and other, uh, other uh, levels uh, that uh, will uh, eventually uh, contribute uh, to uh, tackling uh, terrorism as a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that brings us to another question on the screen, um, the root causes, now I'm not sure certainly not a root justification for ever blowing up your fellow citizens. But in terms of root causes, President Juncker has suggested that development aid could count towards the 2% defence spending target. Um, is that something that you see as feasible or that you believe uh, NATO members and, and NATO headquarters would support? Well, uh, when, I, when I come back to uh, the decision in Wales and then I reconfirmed in, in, in Warsaw, the 2% commitment uh, uh, relates uh, to uh, defence. Uh, uh, we uh, obviously, I uh, cannot say uh, that uh, uh, development uh, tools do not contribute uh, to uh, fighting uh, terrorism. Uh, but um, uh, I believe they, uh, these will have to be uh, addressed in a much broader framework. Uh, where uh, we will uh, uh, clearly define uh, what the military can do what other organizations can do and uh, uh, will provide uh, coordination mechanisms uh, to uh, balance all these measures uh, to uh, uh, the greatest possible effect. Uh, up to now, uh, uh, for example, the European Union uh, had a number of uh, activities uh, in uh, development area uh, under the Commission. Then another activities uh, in, in uh, um, capacity building, institution building uh, by external action service. NATO uh, was uh, doing a lot of activities in terms of uh, capacity building and as well institution uh, building. We have to uh, bring all these uh, uh, activities together, uh, uh, provide uh, more, more coordination, uh, more alignment, uh, and uh, uh, only then we can uh, address successfully uh, the root causes uh, uh, because uh, uh, there is uh, obviously no security without development and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul Fisher asks, what are the prospects for harmonizing capability development plans under all of these NATO efforts? And are the member states willing to better integrate their long-term plans? Or are we going to keep hitting these sovereignty hurdles where you see a little bit of coordination and integration at the edges, but not really true integration? I think we see a lot of uh, uh, coordination efforts within uh, a NATO defence planning process uh, where uh, all these processes are coordinated and uh, uh, nations are working towards uh, their agreed uh, capability targets. Uh, we also do a lot of efforts uh, within NATO to um, uh, coordinate uh, um, development uh, of uh, new capabilities. Uh, the same is ongoing on the EU side. Um, um, we will always have a uh, national interest uh, to protect the, uh, their uh, national industries. However, there are uh, multiple uh, projects to, um, 
today within a framework nation concept, within a smart defense and pulling and sharing initiatives in NATO and EU, where nations are bringing their resources together to develop AK capability together. I think instead of creating a framework that would be prescriptive to nations, it is better to allow natural development through, let's say, clusters where nations bring their resources together based on historical experience or language proximity. And these clusters may eventually lead to a much better shared development of capabilities in future. Well, your cluster point makes me think of a challenge that, frankly, I hadn't really thought of that much uh, before today, but it's the multilingual working environment that you deal with at NATO, where you're not just working across a, a few physical borders, you're, you're really dealing with some of the most difficult uh, complications for making things work on a battlefield and so on. How, um, how do you deal with that multilingual challenge in NATO? We uh, um, work uh, in an environment uh, uh, that is uh, highly interoperable, and one of uh, the levels of interoperability is uh, language. Mm -hmm. uh, number of procedures uh, are uh, developed uh, uh, from the outset in English. Some environments, uh, like um, Air Force, uh, they clearly operate uh, exclusively in English. Uh, it's uh, much less uh, with uh, land forces, but uh, wherever we operate in a joint environment, uh, we use the same standards uh, and the same procedures that are uh, NATO-wide. Uh, we use uh, even these procedures uh, with uh, NATO partners, and many of our partners, and we were talking on uh, Australia and New Zealand, are introducing uh, NATO standards into uh, their forces uh, to be uh, better interoperable uh, whenever we uh, work together. So. Uh, this uh, level of interoperability is expanding uh, both in uh, technological uh, as well as a human level. Mm -hmm. And another example where I think clusters could be quite effective is in cyber defences. Now, I only ever worked on the civilian side, but I did have some knowledge of how uh, civilian infrastructure was protected when I worked inside the EU. And there was really only eight countries that had their act together when it came to, to cyber, and a lot of other followers and a lot of other weak links. Um, can you tell us of any examples that you think can be scaled up and copied, or where you think um, there are some real cluster leads where they can, can really work with the other NATO members to, to get them up to a higher standard on the cyber threats? Um, I, I think um, it's um, um, beyond even, uh, even uh, any talk that uh, cyber uh, is a great concern uh, for uh, both the civilian and military environment uh, today. And NATO is paying great attention uh, to uh, cyber. Uh, we not only uh, uh, work internally on uh, protection of our own networks, uh, but we also assist uh, uh, NATO allies as well as partners uh, in protecting their uh, own networks. Uh, um, uh, there is a NATO Center of Excellence uh, on cyber in Estonia. Uh, with a uh, uh, NATO cyber range. Uh, we have a uh, dedicated uh, NATO capability for um, uh, cyber defense and cyber protection. Uh, there are uh, more than 200 uh, experts uh, that are uh, ready uh, to assist nations in developing uh, their uh, uh, national uh, plans and programs. Uh, we also have uh, uh, cyber uh, repatriation teams that are ready to assist uh, nations when uh, they are affected. We have a, a, a malware uh, sharing uh, platform where uh, uh, we share with all the nations uh, um, any uh, practices, uh, best practices uh, from uh, facing uh, uh, cyber attacks. Uh, NATO also cooperates with a number of uh, uh, private actors uh, as uh, IT companies uh, in uh, uh, improving uh, cyber defense and cyber protection. So um, there is a wide variety within NATO, but we also have a, a very extensive cooperation uh, with the EU on cyber mm -hmm. and uh, a number of concrete measures uh, on which uh, we are working with the EU. Uh, so, um, I think, uh, um, not that uh, we are well served in the cyber arena, but uh, we are uh, uh, making a lot of progress uh, in a number of uh, aspects of cyber domain. And does the development of cyber really change NATO's relationship 
with private contractors, for example? I guess in the development of conventional weapons, you know, there's fairly clear processes and timelines about how you get a weapon made and how you um, bring it into your capabilities. But with cyber, there are so many different front doors, side doors, back doors, everything happens so quickly. Um, how, how is it different working with private tech contractors? I think it's uh, uh, fair to remind that uh, NATO uh, leaders uh, decided uh, uh, that uh, cyber will be handled as an operational domain uh, in, in Warsaw. It has a direct effect uh, in a number of, uh, of areas. Uh, uh, um, uh, cyber uh, became an uh, integral part of all our uh, operational planning, training, education, uh, as well as uh, capacity building. And uh, as uh, we deal with uh, private industries in developing other capabilities, uh, we also deal with private inter industries in developing cyber capabilities. So uh, there are uh, numerous co uh, contacts uh, with, uh, with uh, private companies. Uh, last week, uh, we had uh, one uh, big exercise in Poland uh, where a number of private companies uh, were taking part. It was not solely focused on, on cyber, but the cyber uh, element uh, was uh, there uh, strongly present. And uh, we can see the interaction uh, between uh, uh, private companies uh, and uh, NATO uh, uh, growing uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, for us it's very useful to have a, a perspective uh, of, uh, of a private uh, uh, defense sector present in all our activities. Now a question from Jane's defense that raced right up to the top of the list and I've been sitting on it for a few minutes. Um, they ask, by when will NATO's reformed command structure and the bulk of its NRF beyond the spearhead force be ready to fully deploy to Eastern Europe if needed? Uh, decision to uh, uh, review or, or adapt uh, NATO command structure uh, was uh, um, taken uh, in uh, Warsaw and uh, um, we are now uh, working on it, so it is in the process. We will uh, review uh, first uh, results uh, by the end of uh, August and uh, uh, the date for presenting options uh, to uh, the ministers uh, will be ready by the end of this year and ministers of defense will discuss it in February 2018. It is um, uh, a large amount of work uh, and a number of considerations uh, have to be uh, discussed and developed into concrete proposals. It is also uh, uh, an area that is uh, sensitive uh, to nations because of uh, geographical footprint and uh, the ceilings. Uh, but uh, uh, our main uh, effort is uh, to uh, make uh, NATO command structure uh, fit uh, for purpose, uh, fit uh, for uh, current uh, challenges, but also for future challenges. Uh, addressing uh, uh, new challenges, especially cyber and, and hybrid, uh, in a much better way than, than before. And uh, as uh, for uh, uh, the NRF uh, and the Spearhead Force, uh, when we talk about spear, uh, Spearhead Force, we are talking uh, on uh, VJTF, that is a very joint high risk uh, task force. Uh, uh, the, uh, force of uh, up to uh, 5,000 deployable in five to seven days. Uh, this uh, force has been established uh, and uh, trained uh, uh, for uh, this year. It's uh, United Kingdom who uh, uh, is in command of uh, this, uh, this force. Uh, uh, we are working on a number of uh, measures that uh, would uh, facilitate uh, the deployment of uh, both uh, VJTF and NRF if necessary. Uh, and here I, I mostly talk about uh, logistic, uh, logistics infrastructure and uh, some uh, administrative measures. Uh, um, many people probably heard uh, about uh, uh, the difficulties uh, in allowing uh, Allied troops uh, moving across Europe because of uh, different uh, uh, um, national, national uh, uh, rules. Now uh, we manage uh, to uh, bring all uh, these uh, restrictions down to just a couple of days. So the flexibility to move forces across uh, Europe uh, has increased. So I believe that uh, uh, we uh, can say that uh, we are able to um, deploy both uh, VJTF and NRF effectively. Already? Okay. Yeah. Good news. Now a question from Dr. Sherlos. Uh, I can't quite see the name and I think it's partially been answered. So it's a question about potential duplication from the EU's new defense and security package. 
Um, so I think you were clear that it's complementary rather than um, duplicating, but maybe if you could elaborate a bit more on how the two sides can avoid duplication. I think uh, what is necessary to say uh, at the, the very beginning that the uh, uh, European Union uh, never declared an ambition uh, to uh, provide uh, structures and forces for collective defense. That's clearly a task, uh, task for NATO. Uh, uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, focus uh, of EU uh, defence policies is uh, mostly uh, on uh, crisis management and, uh, and uh, projecting stability. Uh, that is uh, to uh, assist uh, forces in the, in the countries affected uh, by instability in uh, developing their own capabilities, uh, provide uh, assistance, uh, training, as well as economic uh, assistance and help. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, through uh, the coordination uh, that uh, we witnessed today at the top level uh, between uh, Secretary General of NATO and, uh, and uh, uh, High Representative uh, Federica Mogherini, she, uh, she is uh, quite often uh, taking part in uh, our uh, top level meetings. Uh, Jens Stoltenberg is taking part in EU uh, top level meetings. Uh, we also have uh, uh, coordination at uh, lower uh, um, and more practical uh, levels uh, between uh, uh, two chairmen of military committees, uh, between uh, directors of military staff and also at the staff level. So um, uh, we make all our efforts to avoid uh, duplication uh, through uh, better coordination and synchronization of, of our efforts. Maybe one area you could duplicate is in the area of gender, where you spoke recently, NATO has actually had 41 gender-themed uh, conferences, and you spoke about the need to incorporate gender perspectives into um, the daily work at NATO in order to push boundaries, to break stereotypes. Um, how do you feel that effort is going, and what, and what is the value of bringing in more women into NATO? Okay, I'll stay away of... Uh, uh I'd say uh, usual arguments uh, that uh, uh, we need uh, uh, to protect the diversity and equality. But I, uh, I would uh, say uh, it is uh, crucially important that uh, we uh, consider a gender element in all our activities. And I will give you a couple of examples. When uh, uh, we uh, operate uh, in, in Afghanistan, uh, uh, one of the crucial elements is how to address uh, uh, the female population, how to uh, get them closer, how to bring them uh, uh, into uh, the efforts uh, of stabilizing the country, uh, um, uh, get uh, more uh, uh, girls and, and women uh, into uh, the administration, into the education process. Uh, how to uh, address uh, some uh, social issues uh, without uh, having, having uh, 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 women on board. It's quite difficult. When uh, we get into uh, the environment uh, like uh, unstable uh, countries uh, to our south, uh, uh, it's always necessary to consider, uh, consider gender, a gender element in all our operations because it, uh, it has a, a strong uh, impact on uh, how uh, the situation develops. Uh, so, uh, we have made uh, uh, gender uh, issues uh, uh, integral part of uh, our activities uh, at uh, different levels. Uh, uh, we have uh, the whole series of uh, documents uh, produced in NATO, but also uh, we made it a practical uh, part of uh, our work. So uh, uh, there is the whole uh, structure of uh, gender advisors uh, from uh, bottom up. Uh, Secretary General is assisted by uh, a special uh, representative uh, for gender issues. Uh, and we you have Rose now, a Deputy Secretary uh, yes, General. Yes, and we have uh, uh, also an annual uh, committee on gender perspectives. Uh, we also have um, an, uh, some activities that are to promote the idea of uh, gender equality such as a uh, yearly uh, run uh, that uh, is to mark the uh, UN uh, uh, Security Council Resolution 1325. That is uh, exactly for uh, 13 kilometers, 250 meters. Uh, and uh, so um, yeah, these, are, these are all, uh, all uh, activities that are uh, um, promoting uh, issue, uh, issue, issues of uh, gender in the NATO. And uh, they are being taken seriously, not just because uh, uh, it's fashionable, but because it's uh, highly practical.
Excellent. Well, on that note, I want us to end right on time because you have an important job to get back to. So thank you, General Pavel. Thank you to all of you for joining us for this Playbook Breakfast. Now, before you leave and enjoy some coffee and some networking, I wanted to thank once again our partners Raytheon, and I wanted to remind you to please fill out the feedback forms so that we can make an even better event for all of you next time. Thank you, General. Thank you very much.